who here knows who the B-52s are? Okay, so we got a good baseline. <laughs> you don't expect to hear that after a TSL. You know. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Brian and I went to see the B-52s in concert in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. 25 years after their heyday, they were still a raucous party on stage. We had a lot of fun. I want to focus in on, though, what happened before the show. It was an experiment in human psychology and self-awareness, probably one that we all experience at every concert we're at in some way. The show was in a massive urban bowling alley of all places that had a standing area with a stage that easily fit a thousand people. We got there early for dinner, and yeah, they actually had a fancy-ish restaurant in this mega bowling alley. After dinner, we beelined for the stage to get as close as possible since it wasn't a designated seating area. We were lucky enough to be in the second row of people from the stage. There was only one person between us and the band at any point of the show. As time went on, we began chit-chatting with the people around us. It was all innocuous chit-chat, none of which I could recall today. After a bit, the fellow in front of us walked away after about 10 minutes of the spot being empty, I moved forward to lean my back on the stage. I was kind of getting stiff from standing for hours, waiting. We got several hours early to get that close. <laughs> After a bit, that same fellow came back, walked up right next to me, and began poking me in the side, <laughs> saying, that's my spot. I was standing there, poke, poke, poke. <laughs> I told him I was just leaning back and moved the two feet back to where Brian was standing. Some time went by, and the fellow disappeared again for a while, this time I think to get a beer. Not wanting to get poked again, I left the space empty. After about 10 minutes of him being gone, a woman came up and snuck into the same empty spot. I began eating my proverbial popcorn waiting for the movie to start. In short order, the guy came back and did the same poke, 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 move. This was my spot. I was standing there. In a moment of luck, he found a second New Yorker that was willing to move away. <laughs> and just like me, without any drama. What is the chance of that? <laughs> Some time went by and the fellow walked away again, I swear. <laughs> Like a common routine, the same story unfolded for a third and final time. Three strangers in a row, three New Yorkers in a row. He sidled up next to it, poked them in the side, saying, This is my space. Now, I'm pretty forgiving of most things. I'm rather zen about the big problems in life. But walking in front of me and stopping, blocking a subway or train door, or randomly poking me in the side, <laughs> really worked me up. <laughs> I let it go this time, but I wasn't um, social with this guy for the rest of the night. The next day, we're scheduled to meet a friend at Cinema Arts in Huntington. We're going to see the opening of the LGBT Film Festival, and our friend was hoping to introduce us to local friends that he knows. I turned to Ryan and said, wouldn't it be funny <laughs> One of these friends that he knows is that same space saver from the concert last night. Brian's like, no way. <laughs> well, it turns out <laughs> the next night we wind up meeting the same guy from the concert in Brooklyn, here in Huntington, and he's friends with a friend of ours. Has this ever happened? I don't know. <laughs> Priceless as this is, it's not enough for my fiance. The event strikes up a conversation with this guy about how concert goers can sometimes be really difficult. <laughs> the guy agrees wholeheartedly <laughs> and begins to tell us stories of past concerts where some attendees would be really obnoxious about their space. <laughs> I'm not picking this up. <laughs> For bonus points, and to give you a little bit of insight into Brian, as a last ditch effort to get me to smile, he asks the guy, do you think those obnoxious people even realize they're being rude or dramatic? <laughs> I 
And the guy says, no, I don't think they even know they're doing it. <laughs> it's at this point that I have to stop looking at Brian. Brian's going to burst out laughing at the banality of it all. It all makes you wonder how often we're guilty of the things we complain about. It's an absurd story, but a good reminder that whoever we interact with today, we very well may interact with tomorrow. <laughs> But maybe, most importantly, this concert-driven story tells me how we can carry around, for a long time, the really small stuff and make it big. We can flip the story of being bumped two feet into a great wrong that requires us to poke, 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 even if we don't learn our lesson the first three times. <laughs> Moments like this, grievances like this, can overwhelm us. Who here has ever succumbed to vivid moments of annoyance over banal pettiness? <laughs> yeah. if, if you didn't have your hand up, try to remember back to uh, lunchtime in school. Or uh, walk with me now through what I see as the primer for moving through the mundane and into the sublime. T.S. Eliot's poetry does this for me. Uh, I, I often joke, there's a point in college where you, have, you, know, you get a fork in the road and you can either go Nietzsche or you can go T.S. Eliot. <laughs> T.S. Eliot for me. His body of work seems to address our insecurities and our foibles while pointing toward that which transcends it all. Eliot was actually raised a Unitarian, but left us as an adult to experiment with various religions and ended up with traditional Christianity in his elder years. There's a line from his poem that I, I didn't read, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, that reminds me of the banality we sometimes succumb to. It goes, For I have known them all, already known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, I know the voices dying with a dying fall, beneath the music, from a farther room, so how should I presume? The larger poem is a metaphor for a man unable to interact or flirt with a group of women. It touches upon feelings of inadequacy many of us feel in our lives, but this particular line has never left me. We know each minute that we can count. We're creatures that in some ways live meaninglessly to a clock. We're terrified through conversations we're too scared to engage genuinely with, or base our lives around the same everyday habits. I'll be at Starbucks just about every morning of the week in town, waiting in line with all the rest of us. Is my life about that next stir of a coffee spoon? Or is it about something more? All of this leads to the poet's question, so how should I presume? Presume to break free of the, the tick-tock of whatever clocks we live by? To presume to talk with those we feel we don't feel worthy to speak with? Presume to not live our lives as though we were in a dying fall or our music was less than another's. A dying fall is a musical reference to the gradual decrease in volume in a piece. Think about that in our life, thinking about our life as a dying fall. Measuring our lives in this way through coffee spoons is to deface what is timeless about us. It subverts what is eternal about the depth of life and gives us the greatest lie the greatest lie, that which is mundane, is most significant. It doesn't put us at ease or find meaning in our days. In fact, making the mundane our, faith, our focus in our lives actually creates a sense of discord. It creates an emptiness and lack of peace that isn't natural for humans, even if it is regretfully all too common. When we live for our habits, or live for that exact space in front of the stage at a B-52's concert, feel free to insert your band of choice, or wallow in our presumptions, we miss out on life. Or as Eliot puts it in a later poem, The Hollow Men, we are the hollow men, we are the stuff men, meeting together, headpiece filled with straw, alas, our dry voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar, shape without form, shade without color.
paralyzed force, jester without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as hollow men, the stuffed men. Eliot has a way with the dramatic turn of phrase, but he often critiques us for not living fully, for not taking steps when it is time to do so, or for not richly keeping the gifts we were given in this precious life. Succumbing to the trivial, we trade our living birthright with a hollow shell. There's a way to live life with color, and not solely shades of gray, but it requires a directness to and an attentiveness. The trap of emptiness or meaninglessness only closes when we live our lives in tempted, unreflected ways. The reading we heard earlier, The Dry Salvages. For me, it's the T.S. Eliot's most spiritual poem. If we live hollow lives due to our quiet muttering or our dry cellars, as he puts it, this poem is a response to that malaise, where he says, for most of us, there's only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time, the distraction fit lost in a shaft of sunlight. The spiritual practice is the attended moment. It's finding the moments of beauty and peace and delicately placing them upon the altars of our consciousness and simply bearing witness whether they be shafts of sunlight, or winter lightning, or times of celebrated joy or relief, it is in these moments that we apprehend the intersection of the timeless with time. It's in these actions that we put down our coffee spoons and stir our lives to another throne. Nothing neat, nothing measurable, intimations, attentions, hints directing to something more than the measure of minutes and seconds. It's in these moments that we incarnate, fully human, fully holy. These moments, though, aren't always based in the peace of nature. Sometimes they shine through in our messy human interactions, filling our hearts, reminding us that we are part of a greater story that began before us and will continue on when our part is finished. On Thursday, Nelson Mandela died at home after a three-month battle with a lung infection. He lived a life that we should celebrate, even though, even through all the pain and through all the loss. Going from serving 27 years of a life sentence for speaking out against a racist, genocidal regime, to serving as that same country's president, is a story that will be a bastion for human perseverance for the ages. In my life, one of my moments between the moments involved President Mandela, as it happens. It was a few years after he was elected president. I was an undergraduate studying abroad at Oxford University, and he was speaking at the university about peaceful struggles, about apartheid, about reconciliation. I didn't actually get to hear him. I just got to wait in the streets as he passed by triumphantly, really. He was coming to talk at one of the world's greatest institutions, of learning, and he was received by streets packed with people as though they were Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. People wanted to witness his presence, just wanted to see him. He knew that the world was a different, we knew that the world was a different place because of his soul. We knew that peace was just much more possible because of Mr. Mandela. I think deep down, we also knew that this human saw extreme suffering and saw extreme joy. And he brought extreme joy and extreme relief to so many people living in bondage. Whether it be the bondage of the oppressed or the bondage of the oppressor, he showed us a way forward that involved peace and reconciliation. His methods involved truth-telling, stories of those abused, and stories of those who did the abusing his Truth and Reconciliation Commission involved brave moments of authenticity, just being there. And those brave moments allowed a nation to move through the pain, through the extreme acts of attentiveness. 
and in some small corner of a street, in a country that was a world away from South Africa, all of us were celebrating our moment between the moments. We're human. There's something more to this life than empty stirrings and coffee spoons. We're witnessing a life that reminds us how to live. All I can say that happened was that he smiled and waved. But that would be painting the most surface of pictures. It's in these moments like this that we remember our connections, our actions, and our strivings have impact, have meaning. They have relevance to the people around us and to the generations that follow us, and sometimes to the world beyond our quiet streets. Not to romanticize our public honoring of Mr. Mandela, our own nation was not always so supportive of him. Though no evidence ever directly tied violence to his actions, the New York Times does write that in 1961, with the patience of the liberation movement in South Africa stretched to the snapping point by the police killing 69 peaceful protesters in Sharpeville Township the previous year, Mr. Mandela led the African National Congress in, onto a new road of armed insurrection. Could you imagine in this country if our government murdered 69 peaceful protesters? How we would respond to that? We can decry acts of violence, but as a nation, it's hard to critique another country. They're revolutionaries when our own patriotism was rooted in the same sorts of things and our own eternal wars were rooted in the same sorts of things. Mr. Mandela served a life sentence, though, for something else. What began with being charged with inciting a strike and leaving the country, leaving the country without a passport, according to the Times, ended with sabotage and a conspiracy to overthrow the state. Mr. Mandela's appeal to this was, I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. He told the court, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal for which I hope to live for and see, realize, but my Lord, if it needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. His life was as far from Eliot's pastiche of the hollow men that I can imagine. No quiet whisperings, no empty mutterings, but a life of substance and dream and hope and rigor. Or in Mr. Mandela's own words, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. There is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living and a life that our own nation had extreme conflict and varied responses to. Remembering apartheid was based off of our own southern segregation. Our own President Carter put pressure on the South African government to release Mr. Mandela. Although he did that, the next presidency reserved, reversed that policy. In 1986, President Reagan said, in defending their society and people, the South African government has a right and a responsibility to maintain order in the face of terrorists. Far from a terrorist, Mr. Mandela would go on with the Nobel Peace Prize, and a later President Bush would welcome Mandela with open arms in the White House celebrating his rise to presidency. I mention Mr. Mandela today because he lived a life that was worthy of remembering. I also feel that such lives as his are the direction this morning's poet, Eliot, was pointing toward. The poems I've read from T.S. Eliot span in time from World War I through World War II. They were not ignorant of the great tragedies, challenges, and hopes of their day, and they ultimately sketch out the impressions of an ethic for an era that continues to hold vibrancy today. And Eliot makes those sketches rooted in a theological mindset. I'll close with the other poem we read earlier, the really short excerpt from Bert, Bert, Bert Norton. Neither from nor towards, at the still point there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance.
I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. And I cannot say how long, for that is to place it in time. This is the theology that grounds the poetry that applies the ethic. We find sustenance in the moments between the moments. Not the practice, not the doing, not the striving, but the being present to the world around us. When time unfolds between our breaths and life inhales our patience, those timeless glimpses can nurture and sustain us. The path of the infinite pressed down upon us. We know we are more than we are not. It validates all the rest. All the effort, all the striving, all the doing. Knowing that we are not merely the sum of our actions, although our actions do matter, but rather we are the witnesses to the eternal scope of life, albeit for a moment. A moment may be long enough, just long enough, to sustain us. Amen, and blessed be.